So I wanted to tell you a little story today about Sir John Templeton and one of his great trades, um, because it's kind of relevant to everything that's going on in the world. Now, the nature of journalism is that journalists, writers, vloggers, we're all competing for your attention. And the result of this battle for clicks is that the news gets sensationalised. In the case of financial journalists, it means we often find ourselves, <laughs> or our headline writers, urging readers or viewers to buy this now or sell this now. But often, however, the best advice is not to buy or sell, but to do nothing. But how many readers or viewers will an article or a vlog urging you to do nothing get? Not very many. And of course, there are times when you really do have to act. So we, the, the content creators, have to find a balance and it's a fine line and I sort of feel I do it reasonably well. Sorry if that's a bit, bit cringy, but investors also have to find a balance between doing nothing and sudden decisive action, periods of inactivity punctuated by sudden bursts. It's a bit like a greyhound's life. They sleep a lot and then they sprint or hit high intensity training. And one man who seems to have found that balance was Sir John Templeton. Now Templeton, he was sort of a US and English. He became a, a billionaire at a time when billionaires weren't to a penny. He was described by Money Magazine in, in 1999 as arguably the greatest global stock picker of the century. And he might also be seen as a poster child for idle investors. Now, the reality of investing is that it can quickly become a full-time occupation. Researching companies, tracking investments, rebalancing portfolios, it really can take over. But Templeton's first great trade seemed to involve no research at all. It was all about timing. In 1939, after almost a decade of Great Depression, general investment psychology was not what you'd call bullish. And when World War II broke out, investors panicked and stock markets fell. Templeton phoned up his broker and told him to buy 100 shares of every New York listed company trading at less than a dollar a share. And there were, I gather, 104 such companies. So Templeton's total outlay, outlay would have been in the region of 10 grand. Didn't matter what the company did, just what its price was and that it was listed in New York. And US industry famously picked up during the war, indeed as a result of it, and the value of Templeton stocks multiplied and he became a very wealthy man as a result of the trade. There was no research, there was no sector allocation, there was no sweat, no grind. He just made a big call at the right time. As the um, famous Rothschild quote goes, buy when there's blood on the streets. But unfortunately for those who would write about such things, there isn't always blood on the street. Such moments do not come along very often. Um, we've seen perhaps three such big moments in the last 20 years. After the dot-com crash, during the global financial crisis 2008, and in March 2020 at the height of the corona panic. That means a lot of time in between. The time of maximum pessimism is the best time to buy, Templeton said. Uh, he was a famous contrarian. And the time of maximum optimism is the best time to sell. Now, Templeton had an uncanny ability to spot trends before they happened. As well as the famous World War II trade, he was early into, J into the Japan boom, he was early into emerging markets, and he got out of the stock market in early 2000 in what must be considered uh, one of the greatest trades ever. And this one did require some research. I'll tell you about it. He knew the global stock market was overvalued in 2000, but how to time the short sale as John Maynard Keynes famously said, the stock market or the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. And in January 2000, Templeton shorted more than 80 Nasdaq stocks. 
He'd identified those trading at the most extreme valuations and he timed his short positions to kick in just before the post-IPO lockdown, lock-up periods, during which insiders can't sell their shares, were set to expire. He knew that most sensible insiders would sell to lock in some of their gains as soon as they were allowed to do so. And he made a fortune. And it was a wonderful top and tail to his career, the 1939 trade and then that. In 2005, he wrote a brief memorandum predicting that within five years there would be financial chaos in the world, <laughs> as there was a collapse of the housing market and government bond yields would crash to zero. So that was another phenomenal call. Now, Templeton's investment style is an object lesson in being patient and in many ways doing nothing. In 1968, he renounced his US citizenship and moved to the Bahamas. And he did this for two reasons. One, to escape the noise of Wall Street and two, to pay less tax. And he spent the rest of his days largely by the beach, eventually dying in 2008 at the ripe old age of 95. But here's the thing, every morning, at his seaside residence, Templeton would leaf through a copy of the Financial Times and check prices. Any news in the paper was always a day or two late. Being where he was in the Bahamas, the copy of the FT he received was a day or two behind those read on the desks of London or, or New York. So any decisions he needed to make were made from that isolated distance. And then when he'd made those decisions, he'd potter off and do whatever it is billionaires do with the rest of their day. Uh, philanthropic, philanthropic hobbies were Templeton's favorite pursuit. But those years operating from the beachside were his most profitable. According to his biographer, Jonathan Davis, and you should check out um, Davis's Investment Trust handbook, by the way, Templeton outperformed the world in index by 6% per annum compound after he moved to the Bahamas, whereas he only matched it before. So what he did is he stripped out all the noise and based everything on his morning read of the FT, which was a day or two late. How about that? An idler's life, if ever there was one. Now, before you judge him for not paying taxes, Templeton was one of the most generous, benevolent philanthropists who ever lived. But like the liturgists of ancient Athens, he wanted to manage his benevolence himself. Hence, low taxes and philanthropy, rather than have it mismanaged and squandered by some incompetent government official obeying some political agenda. So how do we put the Templeton approach into practice? Now, one strategy would be simply to accumulate as much cash as possible, have it sitting in your broker's account, and then wait. And then when the world hits what you deem to be peak and excess panic, perhaps in the event we're currently seeing in the moment that Russia invades Ukraine, then buy. Um, there's an investment trust that the man himself used to manage. It's called the Templeton Emerging Markets Investment Trust. Uh, it, on uh, the LSE, it has the ticker TEMIT, and it's presumably managed according to his philosophies, but it's geared towards emerging markets. I don't own it, but, you know, there is that. But the bottom line is, I guess, think, contemplate, watch, but often do nothing. Thank you very much for watching. I'll be back with another video very soon. Please subscribe to the channel and uh, please also look out for my new Substack, Substack letter. Um, all sorts of investment ideas in there and a special paid report that I'm offering um, where I'll be tipping all sorts of uh, uh, interesting uh, plays where I think you can make money. So that's on Substack. I'll put a link in the comments. But thank you very much for watching and I'll be back with another video very soon. Cheerio.